Hello and welcome back to the Basic Bible Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Thompson, and we are in our series, continuing our series in the Five Points of Calvinism, and this is a part two of a panel discussion I hosted in my Systematic Theology classroom, featuring Gary Zimmerman from Rockford Lutheran uh, School and Scott Whiting, pastor of the Compass Church, a uh, Methodist church right here in Janesville, Wisconsin, and our own friend, our old pal, our old co-host with the most, Ray Jewell, representing an Arminian view. So that's what we, we left off last week with a good discussion, but this week we are joined by another panelist, the one, the only, Aaron White. If you've been a listener to this podcast, you've heard him many times on the podcast before. Aaron is a author, blogger, and uh, is a pastor up in Minnesota right now before he uh, left Janesville or after he left Janesville, Wisconsin. So we're uh, fortunate to finally have Aaron, who was supposed to be at the beginning of the podcast, the beginning of the panel discussion, but unfortunately uh, he was late and kind of forgot. But we're glad he's here now. So he's going to be joining us for this edition. So uh, with all that, I'm going to just, le- if, if you hadn't listened to the first part, go ahead and listen to that first, and then you'll want to jump back in with this episode here. So here's our our panel discussion, part two. So if we enter into salvation through free will, I simply chose it. The question is, can I choose to opt out? Can I get out? If I have, if I have embraced the gospel and, I've, and I claim to be a Christian, can I ever stop becoming a Christian? Are there, uh, is there some sort of sin limit I've got uh, to where, oh, no. You were a Christian. Now you're not. Now you're up. I'm kicking you out, or I'm opting out now. I, I, I've, I've decided. Man, I don't want to be a Christian after all. How? Uh, so the issue is about eternal security, or if we want to use uh, Calvinistic language, perseverance of the saints. So the idea that one, it's not just once saved, always saved, but as a Christian, God begins that process of sanctification, and He who uh, began a good work in me will complete it, see it to fruition. Um, in heaven, or as Pastor White talked about, that that golden chain of redemption. All of those who have been uh, justified will be glorified. So, um, how secure is our salvation? Or I'll throw it out as can man lose his salvation? So, Pastor Aaron, I'm going to throw that to you since you haven't had a whole lot of time to talk since um, somebody was really late and didn't care about the students of Rock County Christian enough to you know care about. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Ray, Ray, would you just punch him with the love of Jesus for me? Oh, okay. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, so real quick, uh, only because it's hard to compartmentalize these things. It's all kind of intertwined, you know. So to answer the question, I'm not going to I'm not going to belabor everything, but. To understand the idea of can you lose your salvation, you have to understand what, it, what is salvation? What are we talking about? And so when it comes to foreknowledge, to the one pastor, I appreciate what he said. He's right. You know, looking at the context of Romans 8, 29. But I would also say that foreknowledge, the word prognosco, um, it has a personal element to it. You know what I mean? It, it doesn't mean looking down the corridors of time to see who will exercise their free will. The whole context of Romans 8, 28, 29, 30. There's personal pronouns. You know, it's not that which he foreknew, like faith. It's those whom he foreknew. It's people, uh, which squares very nicely with Ephesians 1, that it's a knowing and personal relationship of people. Um, so there's kind of like, there's my re- response to that whole idea of salvation. Is that we're still dealing with God's knowledge of people and knowledge like Adam knew his wife. You know, it's personal, intimate knowledge. It's not a knowledge of, of actions. Um, but then also... The idea of, well, what did Christ do on the cross? What was a propitiation? Well, what does propitiation mean? It means a wrath-satisfying sacrifice. So to say Jesus died for the whole world, well, we have to parse our words and say, do you mean that he was a wrath-satisfying sacrifice for everyone head for head? Because if that's what we mean, then that's universalism, um, which I hope everyone in this circle would denounce. And so just by the etymology of the words that we're using, Jesus' death did something. It satisfied the wrath of God. So if God's wrath is satisfied for person A, person A rejects Christ, goes to hell under the wrath of God, that's called double jeopardy. And that's a fairly unsavory position that Jesus would die for their sins and suffer the wrath of God. But because they rejected him, they're going to suffer again 
you know, God's wrath is going to be poured out again a second time. Um, so I disavow that whole thing on exegetical and philosophical grounds. It just doesn't work. Um, the biblical evidence is, is clear in my mind that when it comes to preaching the gospel, this offer of salvation, yes, goes out to the whole world, meaning Jew and Gentile, you know, all men. But it's inescapable the fact that Christ's cross did something effective for a specific group of people whose identities are only known to the Lord uh, from every tribe and tongue. Uh, and that when we preach the gospel, people will get saved. Because as he told Paul with the city of Corinth, which Corinth was a train wreck, Paul was ready to leave. And he says, go on preaching, for I have many people in this city who are mine. But he didn't give Paul the names of those people. Well, he said, what about the people who, who don't respond to the gospel? Or will they get justice? which we all deserve justice. None of us deserves to be saved. So God's not in the dock. You know, God doesn't need to be vindicated by a PR campaign. He's perfectly just in what he does. And when it comes to, if the fact is that Christ satisfied God's wrath for a specific group of people, those people will be kept because that's the promise of the new covenant according to Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36. When Jesus lifted the cup and says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, it was, I am purchasing a group of people, and I will not lose any of those whom the Father has given me. Um, so that doesn't mean that the Christian life is easy. It doesn't mean that God doesn't work through means to keep his people through uh, the preaching of the word, the taking of the Lord's Supper, Christian exhortation. There's a lot of warnings in scripture that are directed at Christians, and those warnings are means uh, that God uses in addition to promises. So I don't mean to sound like flat, black and white, you know, God saves, don't worry about it. Not at all. That's why it's the doctrine of perseverance. Uh, it's not a lazy boy mentality, but when I'm feeling as if I can't keep myself saved and I'm losing it, I look to the, the doctrine of predestination and election and the promise of the new covenant and say, he who began a good work in me will complete it to the end. All right, Mr. Jewell. <laughs> How did I know you were coming in there next? Um, I look at specific examples. For one thing in scripture, you've got Judas. Of course, that brings up the question, was he ever really saved or not? Well, I mean, he was one of the disciples. And obviously he... We're going to be talking about that in the future podcast. He, well, yeah. That's another story. But obviously he, well, I mean, I don't know if he ended up in heaven or not. I tend to doubt it because he you know, betrayed the Messiah. So it was within God's plan and will that that happened. Um, there's Demas who, you know, Paul, we don't know a whole lot about Demas, but he was once a part of Paul's group and abandoned that, whether it was just like John Mark abandoned and went back home or if it was a, a walking away from uh, Christ. I think uh, this is the way I look at salvation for, for individuals. So it's harder to become a Christian than most people think. I mean, it's more than just saying the sinner's prayer. It's also more difficult to walk away, I, but I do believe it's possible to to lose salvation but it's it's more of a constant turning away from god on a regular basis to where you know to me the the blasphemy of the holy spirit is that you decide you know what i don't believe this anymore i i don't believe that jesus is who he says he is i think he's just a good man uh all the things that that people would say, and then you know, so I don't trust in his in in his work on the cross, and you know that's that's pretty that's a pretty dangerous step to take, and I know that uh, at least in my past, uh, Calvinists would say, well, then that person was never really saved. Where and our men would say, well, yeah, he was at one time because you know, all I got to do is look at the fruit that uh, he produced, and uh, you know, but I mean. God's the one that judges that, not you and not me. And, um, but you know, I think that uh, uh, talks about tasting the fruit of, of uh, the goodness of God and then turning away from it. Now, some people would say that's an initial rejection. I think that it's not possible for someone to do that even uh, later in life. Um, and that, you know, so that perseverance, yes, we have to turn to God for that. But, um, you know, 
you know, we have a, a part in that too. I think that, well, and that's where the, the concept of free will is overshadows the scope of discussion for me. All right, Mr. Zimmerman. Uh, so in, in response to the last question, I talked about how the doctrine of election is, is viewed as a, a source of comfort for Christians who are, who are struggling um, because they're led back to Christ and that, that ultimately their salvation relies on him and what he does. Um, for example, in John 6, 39, it says, and this is the will of him who sent me that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. Well, that's Jesus talking, and he's not going to lose a single one of his elect. At the same time, the Bible does clearly teach that people can fall away from the faith. Um, for example, um, uh, Timothy talks about um, some preachers, I don't remember their names exactly, Hymenaeus and Alexander, something like that, who have turned against him uh, towards the end of his, his ministry. Um, uh, Jesus uses a parable of the, the sower where uh, the seed, which is the word, takes root, um, but then is either choked out or withers. Um, so that's an example of, of faith being uh, taking root but being lost. Jesus calls himself the vine and us the, the branches, and that whoever has life has life through him. And Paul talks in Romans about how the Jews were broken off so that we could be grafted in and also talks how the, the Jews could also be grafted back in again. Um, so this is what, what is in, in Luther circles uh, referred to as law, because this is uh, speaking to us and telling us, yeah, you can lose your faith. It is something that you should be concerned about. Um, but once, once we are concerned about it, where do we turn? We turn to Christ. Um, so, you know, ultimately, it's all about what Jesus has accomplished for you, um, because if it's about a decision you've made, I don't know about you, but I've decided to go on a diet many times, and uh, <laughs> I still need to make that decision again. But also, at the same time, as Ray was saying, some people wonder well, am I really one of God's elect? Um, you know, if, if only the elect are going to be saved, is, is that me? And, and the, the thing is, we don't have everything revealed to us by God. He, he has revealed that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Um, so Lutherans uh, refer to God's word as, as one of the means of grace. And, and what's important is that we are continually connected to that means of grace. We're continu continually in God's word and continually having the spirits uh, renew us in our faith. Um, so then, Pastor, Pastor White, I'm going to give you the, the last word in this question. All right. Well, yeah, I, I guess, um, yeah, to put simply, I, I definitely believe somebody can walk away from God. Um, thus you know lose their salvation if that's the term you know we we, we want to use you know um salvation is, is a pretty broad word you know it, you know it, it involves justification you know that initial faith we put in christ and our sins are washed away but uh salvation uh, salvation biblically speaking also refers to sanctification so it's that work the continuing work, that molding work of becoming more in the image of Christ, that's also salvation. And then uh, salvation is also used of, of uh, our future glorification when our bodies are transformed. So, you know, you hear preachers sometimes say, you use a, a phrase like this, um, I, I was saved, I'm being saved, and I will be saved. I mean, ultimately, that's salvation. It's a it's a holistic thing, um, and uh, and you know, I think Gary's right. You know, I agree with uh, his interpretation of of all of those verses. You know, particularly the parable of the sower. You know, you definitely see uh, some spiritual activity in that parable, 
uh, as the seed is planted, the, you know, and the seed is the word of God. Um, there's, there's an initial, uh, you know, something happening. Somebody received it with joy, um, you know, sprouted up, but uh, there was no root. And so it withered and, or it got choked out by the cares of this world. But in each one of those cases, there, there was something, a plant was growing. And it was only uh, those with that fertile soil where it went deep and they didn't get distracted and, and uh, caught up in the cares of the world. Uh, that's the ones that ultimately produce fruit. Um, and I, I think that, um, you know, I think that all of those teachings really, um, you know, uh, go to, to make the point of we, we got to stick with this. Um, I think Raymond, or no, maybe it was Gary, mentioned uh, Timothy. You know, Paul Paul gets, you know, in 2 Timothy, you know, he says, now there is laid up a crown for me. Um, but he doesn't say that um, until, you know, he gets to the end of his life. Um, he knew he was about to be martyred. And that's why he says, first, um, I finished the race. I've, I've finished the course. And now there's laid up for me a crown. Um, you know, it seems as though his understanding was you, you've got to hang on to this faith um, throughout your life. Um, you can turn back. Um, you know, the clearest verse, you know, that I, I think you know, from Paul's writing is in Colossians 1. 22, uh, 23, where he says, you were once alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish, free from accusation. So I would say for sure, uh, Colossians 1, he's talking about born again believers here um, who've got a lot of hope. Uh, for eternal life. But then he goes on in verse 23 to say, if you continue in your faith. So those promises, those hopeful expectations, and even the salvation that he's referring to, the washing of their sins, is, is really only guaranteed if they continue in their faith. Um, and, uh, you know, the mention's already been made of Demas and Hermogenes and these others who who turn back. So, um, so yeah, I think, I think we can experience something spiritual, which we could call justification, or, you know, we could go so far in sanctification, but if, uh, but our free will is still intact, we can still choose not to be in a relationship with God. We can choose not to be. That's, that's my take on those. And I know reformed theologians have a different way of looking at all of that, but again, uh, I haven't studied this stuff since like I graduated in 1990. So uh, yeah, I can tell. Um, well, I can't, I can't uh, remember all them arguments, but I, I know there's other ways of looking at it. But again, like I'm I'm out of seminary for so long. A uh, very simplistic, just easy reading of of the scripture. That's what it says to me. All right, you got like 30 seconds. Okay. Well, I just wanted to say to, to the thing that I think is there for us to help us prevent falling away is the church. If we stay uh, actively involved with other believers, uh, and of course the Holy Spirit, uh, but we, we, you know, we stay in those instead of trying to do it all on our own, I, I think that that is a huge aspect that sometimes gets missed. We look at this as an individual thing, but I think it's a corporate thing as well. Yeah. And we, um, we need to be there for each other. Okay. I'm going to have you stop. Um, and, uh, okay, I'm going to give myself 30 seconds here um, because I can't resist. And, um, but I, I, I think it was, I kind of want to piggyback off of what, what uh, Pastor White had said. Um, I think Romans 8, this, this whole idea of golden chain of salvation is, is great. But also even going, th going uh, to verse 30, 31, down through the end of the chapter also, what can separate us from the love of Christ? Um, nothing. And it goes through all this list of different things. Um, it is God who justifies. So I, I would say I don't justify myself. Uh, I was saved not by my work, but by the work of Jesus Christ, which never changes. 
And so in, in my view, that salvation would never change. Um, and, and, if, and if God begins that work of sanctification in my life, he is going to bring that to completion. Um, I think it was John MacArthur who said, if I could lose my salvation, I would. Um, but, okay, I'm going to shut up now. Um, no. I'm expecting clapping and uh, applause from my students now. What references? Um, Resources. No, uh, yeah, uh, so I'm, we're going to end with one last question just about um, is there a book or is there a resource that you would recommend our students to look at um, if they want to dig a little deeper? Ray, I think you've got a couple. Of yeah, here. I do. I purchased both of these. Excuse me, Mr. Jewell. Uh, Keep it professional. Why I'm Not a Calvinist by Jerry Walls and Joseph Dangil, G-E-I-L. -G and the other, the opposite end of the spectrum is Why I'm Not an Arminian by Michael, where is it here? Michael Williams and Robert Peterson. I think that you know, it's just an interesting perspective on viewing these viewpoints or seeing these viewpoints from the opposite uh, spectrum there. And I think that can be helpful. Anybody else want to throw out a, a resource? Chosen by God by R.C. Sproul. Mm. I got nothing but the Bible. <laughs> There's always that one guy who has to say that. <laughs> yes, we do recommend everyone read the Bible. <laughs> I'll, I'll send you some links, Kevin. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, if there's somebody who's really ambitious, uh, they can try to read The Bondage of the Will by Martin Luther, but it's... Uh, Which is right back over there in our classroom library. But it's in, uh, probably... No, it's, it's, it's very difficult. So um, The one resource I want to throw out, I, I do love Chosen by God by Sproul, um, but um, there were two books written a few years back, For and Against Calvinism. Uh, for Calvinism, written by Michael Horton, against Calvinism, written by Roger Olson. But if you get the Kindle version, you get both books, but they also include video clips of a debate uh, those two authors had. And I think it was, it's really, a, it's a good discussion. It's a respectful discussion. And it's an in-depth discussion um, that I would highly recommend you look at. Um, and there are several books back there as well in our classroom library. Okay, we have gone way over time and I wanna just thank you guys for joining us.